Um, welcome to AI Fights Back, our webinar series that is um, designed to help business learn about AI and uh, how it can bring value to their business, their organization during these uh, tough times. Uh, I'd like to welcome Keith Davey, CEO of Marina Software, uh, to the series. Uh, thanks for taking time out today. I know you're busier than ever. Keith is going to talk to a journey to machine learning. Um, Marina Software are probably one of the very few longest standing digital agencies in Ireland. I think if not 15, maybe 20 years old. Um, so... Uh, They've seen a lot. Um, I think what's really interesting about the talk today is that Keith is going to go through really how um, machine learning has become uh, really accessible to business. A lot of off-the-shelf solutions there. He's going to take us through the um, practical elements of that, really good uh, use cases, um, uh, and how it develops a very strong uh, user-centric or customer-centric um, um, solution as well or result. And they have, um, Keith and Marino have some major clients um, that are testament to that as well. Um, so that's our talk today. Uh, just a little bit about uh, the, the, the webinar series. Uh, it's 12 weeks of seminars and um, we are on week three now. We have three that we clustered into manufacturing for manufacturing folk out there. We have three more on the way. Uh, Steph is gonna go and talk about um, the historian and AI on the 14th of May. We have AI for manufacturing for technical community on the 21st of May. Uh, and Matthew from um, Mockingbird Consulting um, out of Wales is going to talk about social distancing and IoT solutions as well. So um, that's really, really good content. So I want to put those on your radar straight away because I know there are a few of you out there from um, the area of manufacturing with us here today. Um, and we're very happy to be partnering with the ICBE on the manufacturing-led uh, webinars as well. So please do share with others uh, and we look forward to that. You can register on Eventbrite, of course, as well. Outside of that, I want to welcome our guest contributors. Um, you'll see here, Claire Dillon, uh, our journey to Thrustworthy uh, uh, AI. Um, Ashwini Matur from Novartis is coming in on the, 40th, the 4th of June. Um, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Ian Kiani from Skellig.ai, who is going to take data science versus privacy uh, during these very um, challenging times as well. So really super relevant content, uh, great webinars. We're really looking forward to them. And thank you to those who are also coming in and doing the guest slots as well. There is, I believe, maybe one or two left. So don't be afraid, approach me, tell me what you're thinking. All they have to be is practical to business during these times um, in order to come on board. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, everybody is on mute so you can sit back and relax. We don't have the text on today, but we're a small enough group. If you have questions and comments, we will take those, um, we'll put audio on at the end of this and take those and, and take a little bit of discussion around that. Um, uh, our hashtag is AI Fights Back. Uh, uh, please reach out on social media. It's a, it's a big deal to the series as well. Um, and enjoy. Um, talk to you soon. Over to you, Keith. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so to give everyone a little bit of background, Marino Software is a services company based in Dublin. Um, we also have offices in Spain and have had offices in New York and have one customers in all parts of the world really in the caribbean in north america and europe um really focused on the uh customer experience uh digital customer experience for what are largely b2c customers um so domestically in ireland our customers include permanent tsb esb independent news um internationally we've also worked with digicel with bell in canada um, and and Dixon's Carphone in the UK and Curry's in the UK currently as well. Uh, so mostly B2C, so mostly communicating with a large block of customers. Um, and really what that's meant for us over the last 
12, 13 years has been, uh, it's, it's largely app driven. And um, so it's mostly been mobile apps, a lot of, a lot of iOS and Android development alongside web. Um, and if you look at our website, um, you probably have noticed that we don't call ourselves a, a machine learning or, or AI company. Um, we don't, we don't really refer to that and that's something I need to change, but it's been on my list for a while and I haven't gotten to it. So we will get there. Um, because we've actually done quite a bit of machine learning um, without necessarily taking an approach that we had to completely rebrand the, the company to be a machine learning driven company. Um, so we, we actually uh, have always been aware of machine learning. I mean, we're, we're a large team of technical people in the company. Um, but machine learning up until maybe, you know, middle of the most recent decade probably 2015 was a was a highly technical field and uh very much something driven by academic research um and wasn't terribly accessible and what really started to change that was the fact that the larger uh tech companies started to get involved in the space you've obviously seen tools that they would have brought out like things like apple siri and uh the sort of things amazon have done um, with Alexa, but it's become more and more accessible for other people to use through those larger tech companies. So uh, back in 2016, we went to a Google agency day, which was a day that they ran for, for agency companies like ourselves. And they gave a number of talks about different things, web development, app development. And the one that really struck me most was the one about machine learning. Um, and really what they were trying to lay out was a course for companies like us to become machine learning service providers and they lay that out in five steps and in preparing for this i look back at the the notes of what they actually suggested that you needed to do and they uh they highlighted the reasons why this was about to change um why it was going to become more important for agencies and the first reason was obviously the growth in the amount of data that was available uh that was being collected and was available on online um, so there's, there's obviously a huge amount of data which is completely not analyzed at all um, and it's only growing. So as IoT becomes more prevalent and when we step forward into the world of 5G in the future, assuming all the towers haven't been burnt down in the meantime, um, we will get even more data uh, available that, that will be captured by telcos and security companies with camera feeds and, and all sorts of opportunities to, to gain data. Lots of privacy problems with all that, but the data is being gathered. Um, the other thing that was what was happening was the fact that the uh, hardware was becoming more and more available, uh, that you could buy cards which were very, very powerful and could process this data in a, in a fairly time efficient manner in a, for a price point that was no longer in hundreds of thousands or millions, but you could, you could buy hardware for a few thousand um few thousand euro and also the software was starting to become available so you had the fact that uh neural net software that you could run locally yourself on your own hardware was was available at that point in time around 2015 2016 so the door was starting to open and the points they raised as the the steps they raised as the the steps you needed to take were were these so they said that the first step was to take a look at cloud-based solutions. So we were starting to see machine learning cloud-based solutions um, run by Amazon on AWS, run by Google in, in Google Cloud Project, and run by Microsoft in Azure. Um, but it was only the very beginnings of that. Uh, the cloud-based solutions were really hosted versions of the neural net software. So that might have been TensorFlow, by Google, which was which was open sourced, and you could actually go on and use it in the cloud rather than having to set up your own infrastructure for that. What they suggested that the next step will be that you do custom machine learning, which would be to build your own models and um, and build your own systems. Then they said you'd have to acquire hardware uh, and actually, you know, build your own uh, infrastructure to run the machine learning tools. Uh, and then the one that probably scared me the most at the time was the fact that they suggested that you needed to build a team, which would involve a large team of data scientists, which was obviously an area we didn't work in. So that would be a completely new set of people we'd need to hire uh, and would be a significant cost. And then that you would have to go and find data that you could use and, and use in your models. Um, 
so we started down this journey and I suppose what we really started with was the step one. Um, so we started looking at cloud-based solutions. And when you look at this, this is an old screenshot of what Amazon had uh, even a year ago. And this is actually, the, there's far more up there now. Um, what, what started to happen was that the machine learning uh, in the cloud, the hosted sort of solutions became more and more solution driven. So where they had been complex systems that you would have to train yourself. You can see here that Amazon started to host things like Amazon Polly, which would turn text into speech. Amazon Translate, which was allowing you to do machine learning for translation. Amazon Textract, which is one we've used quite a bit, which lets you actually uh, te grab text from imagery. Um, the original systems are still there. The neural net systems are still there, and you can still use those. So you can still use things like TensorFlow. Um, but they've been simplified by the fact that they're, they're, they're totally cloud-driven services now, um, which means the barrier to entry is far, far lower. And the number of these services is much, much bigger. Like Amazon now have probably 20 or 30 services. I think Azure have 35 and Google Cloud Project uh, have about 20 something as well. So they're starting to specialize each of these services into individual solutions which makes it easier to get into because you don't have to figure out how to tailor the the software to to fulfill the function that you're actually trying to achieve um the the next thing that happened in that time was all, all this software started to be open sourced so things like tensorflow was open sourced and has been developed quite aggressively and it's backed very heavily by google um, and tensorflow is an incredibly powerful system um, and it runs a lot of Google's own uh, AI machine learning systems and it's very very flexible because it is a neural network system so it can work on on text data and it can work on image data uh, video inputs um, and we started down the track of using this so we we got some of our developers to learn how to train tensorflow how to take models and actually build models from data from from imagery that we could source from customers and how to actually turn that into a tensorflow model that we could query and get results out of um, and it was significant that it was open source for us because the other alternatives at that time were quite expensive and we could run it locally on our on our own machines and we hadn't invested in hardware at this stage so we were able to run it locally but it took a long time and it was slow and the, the processing uh, of let's say if you took a few thousand images that you needed to get into a TensorFlow mo flow model, that could take a couple of days to actually process into a model uh, on a laptop that you could actually make use of. So it was quite a slow process. Um, so going back to the list, we've done step one and step two to a certain extent. When it came to step three, what's happened is, is that we don't need step three. Um, the cloud systems have advanced enough now that uh, there's pretty much no reason to build hardware infrastructure unless you're really, really going to try and do a hell of a lot of machine learning training and training of an actual of an actual machine learning model, um, which you probably don't need to do, um, given that you can do all that in the cloud. And as I was saying, when you try and run uh, these sort of systems yourself, they're, they're quite, they take quite a lot of time and they're quite hardware intense, but in the cloud, you can scale up and down as much as you need to for that period of time and then scale back down afterwards and save yourself a lot of money and investment in hardware. So I don't really see the need to invest in the hardware now. The other thing we haven't really done is we haven't built a team of data scientists. Um, we've basically learned how to do it. So our software developers have done this, but even it's, get, it's getting to the point where you don't have to be very technical at all to start using these systems to a certain extent. Now it does get technical. There's no, I can't deny the fact that like it's useful to know how to write some code. It's useful to understand some networking and, and how to connect these systems together, but it is getting less and less technical. And I think what's happened very recently is we're really moving into the era of serverless computing as well. So we're not even really setting up servers in the cloud. We're using uh, these artificial intelligence systems as functions as a service. Um, so you're using them directly without even running dedicated servers in the cloud, just running the services themselves. Uh, the one and the step five, I think, is interesting because, um, as Google had said, we should go and source data. I don't think we've ever sourced data. I think at every point in time, the customers already had the data. Um, they've already had data sitting in 
filing cabinets on on shares in a folder somewhere. Um, they've been collecting this data for years and didn't know what to do with it, didn't know what to do with it, and it's just been left idle. Um, some of our customers are telecoms companies. They have a huge amount of information about behavior on networks and, and the sort of how users use services. Um, other ones are doing things like collecting ID for, for customers. They're, they're onboarding customers with know your customer and anti-money laundering like processes, processes that you'd be familiar with, let's say through a bank like Relex or N26 where you'd upload photo ID. Um, we had lots of customers, particularly ones with retail stores, would have been taking scans of somebody's driving license, let's say, and then it goes into a folder somewhere and nobody knows what happens after that. We just know it was recorded. There was, there was something recorded for that user. But none of it was ever looked at again. So customers come to us with data is what really happens. Um, so the point of having to go and find it has never really, it's never really been a problem for us. Um, another thing that is very attractive to you doing machine learning for us is the fact that machine learning is by its very nature is a, it's a it's a piece of experimental development um and the definitions of the types of r d that you can do um in in ireland uh would include experimental development as something that you can claim back the corporation tax on so when when doing this type of work um we're able to factor in that we will be able to claim back the corporation tax on that work, which is obviously very useful. And it's easy, it's an easy one to justify um, in terms of R&D and, and making the R&D claim because uh, it, it is experimental. You're going to try something, it might not work the first time, it's probably gonna be an element of failure in there and then you're gonna tweak and you're gonna come back and try and improve each time. And one of the, the things I've always found with trying to make R&D claims, it, I, th I think your first in instinct sometimes is to write the happy path story where you, you actually succeed, but the failures are important to verify that it was actually, there was risk involved. So you, you probably will try and do some things uh, with machine learning that will fail initially, but you will be able to recoup some of that cost. So what does machine learning look like for Merino? I think it, it really falls into two main categories and those are ones which are natural language processing driven and those which are computer vision driven so what we've tended to do with the natural language processing we've tended to do projects which involve some voice recognition and some voice synthesis and with computer vision it's largely image detection and image classification um, and there's lots of other applications of machine learning of course but we just have we just haven't tended to work with those uh, at this point in time, but we do have projects which might lead us into other areas in the near future. Um, so I'll go through some examples of the type of work that we've done and what we're doing with them today. Um, one of the earliest ones we did was to work on a solution for Know Your Customer anti-money laundering document uploads. So one of our customers is Permanent TSB, an Irish bank, um, who would obviously have onboarding requirements for uh, for their products and they can accept various documents but there's usually the main two where you need some proof of identity and some proof of address so when we're talking proof of identity you're looking at driving licenses and passports and when you're looking at proof of address that's a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of different sources of proof of address it can include things like you know domestic utility bills or, or all sorts of different types of documents which change over time and you can write systems which will uh, identify elements of these documents in a hard-coded way, but because like, let's say, a, a utility could change the format of a bill at any time, in the future, they, they can break your system uh, by, by changing what the, what the format of the documents are. So we started to experiment um, with systems in uh, ourselves with TensorFlow, um, so we started to make machine learning models of TensorFlow and train them with data to recognize driving licenses and passports. So what we found was once we get close to about 100 examples of a document, we could make a model that would be accurate at identifying that document to a greater than 95% accuracy. So what we would do would be we would look for 95 images, let's say, 100 images or you know, in and around that, of a passport. Um, and we'd create a machine learning model and feed that into TensorFlow. And TensorFlow could then, with a high degree of accuracy, uh, recognize a passport in, a, in, a, in an image. So 
we were also able to use Tesseract, which was another open source package from uh, Google, which Google had developed in order to make their Google Books system online, where they were able to scan a huge amount of books, but it's a very good OCR package, which could scan all the text off these documents. And then we used Amazon Recognition, which is a hosted uh, image processing system on Amazon. Um, and what we did with that was, this on the, on the, on the left-hand side is a picture of one of our developers. That's his uh, passport, and we're able to compare the two pictures. And you can see on the right that uh, Amazon Recognition is 96% sure that the person in both pictures is the same person. So even though those pictures were taken years apart and the facial hair is different and, and lots, of, lots of characteristics may have changed, it's still 96% sure that that's the same person. So what we were able to do for Pearman TSB was to demonstrate that we could create an app which would take a photograph of the person at that point in time using the front facing camera. We could upload that picture along with the picture of the document and then compare and say, is the person who's using this app at this point in time, the person in the identity document that they're uploading? And we were able to demonstrate that we will be able to do that. Now, there's a number of things about this example that um, are, I suppose have changed because we used TensorFlow on our own machines and we used Tesseract on our own machines. At this stage now, that wouldn't even be necessary because Amazon, just gone with the Amazon stack, for example, uh, Amazon in the cloud would now have Amazon SageMaker, which we could use instead of TensorFlow, which would be a, a hosted trainable model. And we could also uh, train a model with our own data on there. Um, and they also have Amazon AWS Techstract, tech which would replace Tesseract, which is a hosted uh, version of that. So really what we're trying to do now is we're trying to chain these things together in the cloud. So instead of TensorFlow, Tesseract and Recognition, we can now use SageMaker, uh, Textract and Recognition entirely in the cloud, running nothing locally. This has started to develop now into a, a sort of sister business of Merino uh, called Netzer, which we're, we're, we're starting to build systems like this, targeting uh, telecoms operators who have a lot of data. And one of the uh, companies who've contacted us about helping them with a problem is Digicel. So Digicel in the Caribbean, they have their SME broadband sign up process. And what they, what they actually do is in the, from their office in Kingston, they send a motorbike courier out to take photographs of the identity documents and get them to sign, get the customer to sign a contract. And once they have those, the courier will return to the Digicel office and, and give those documents back in. The problem is that the identity documents have to be checked for validity. And, uh, and the validity basically for them means that the expiry date is in the future. Uh, but they're checked by a human and they go into a queue to be done. And it can take sometimes a couple of weeks before they get actually processed. And the customer can't be provisioned until that process is complete. So what we're looking at doing is basically being able to, uh, on, with the Netzer product, is to be able to do that automatically. But we've been able to go an awful lot further. That, that's actually only a very simple element of it. We're also able to check for, if we do this through an app, we can check for liveness in a video that the, uh, which can be taken while the user is uploading. Um, we can also check for check the consistency of the, the machine readable zone in a document along with the data that's actually in the document. So we can look for fraudulent behavior. We can check the font type. We can check the shape of the document. All these are tests that verify that the document hasn't been tampered with um, and that it's, it's still a, a valid document. Um, so we're still in progress with, with Digicel on that. And um, obviously the demand for that sort of solution has only increased with the current uh, coronavirus situation because they don't really want to be sending people out to customer sites and customers aren't necessarily in their, in their workplaces anyway. Um, so another example of something that we, that we did over the last couple of years was working with ID Mobile, both in Ireland and the UK. The Irish operation has since shut down, but the UK operation is still going. So we were um, able to build a customer service bot for them using entirely hosted uh, machine learning tools. Um, so we built this uh, on the Google platform um, for building these, these sort of things, so not on the Amazon platform. And this was to be embedded in the self-care application that we were working on. And what it would do will be to try and uh, work on offering people a phone upgrade in a, a, as a bot, rather than them having to get through to the call center to figure out whether they're able to uh, whether they whether they have an upgrade available or whether and what type of upgrade they're able to get 
So really what was driving them here was to reduce the number of calls to the call center, which is a, a very common sort of starting point for us with any of these systems. So uh, there's a lot of things that call calls to the call center for telecoms companies. Number one is billing. Upgrades is very, very much up there uh, as something that people continue to contact about and see when they're entitled for an upgrade, are they entitled to a handset? So what we were able to do was integrate code into the actual uh, backend systems of the operator but, and, and check the, the user's actual, uh, whether they had an upgrade available. But everything you're seeing on the screen here, um, all the text, all the questions can be built in a, in a visual WYSIWYG way. Um, there's no need to actually write code to, to make these options available. And it's responding to user input. So it's using the natural language processing capabilities of the platform. So whatever the user might say, it's able to figure out what the next sort of question it should ask is. I think what's very useful about it is the fact that it captures all the, fa all the failures as well. So when you can see the failures, you can um, figure out how to roll them into the system in the future. Um, so the next sort of example of what we did was for Vero, which is a customer of us that does um, a social media network. Um, now, this is, all, this is the point in, um, in these uh, presentations where I always have to explain to people that like, I know they didn't expect to come to a, a webinar talking about porn, but this is about porn. So the thing with Vero was that Vero um, had, a, had a few hundred thousand users and was doing quite well, um, but it, it, hit a, it hit a point where it became, basically a photographer presented Vero at a cosplay conference and it took off. So what happened was we went from 160,000 users on a Tuesday to approximately four to five million users by the following Sunday. Um, and because there's a lot of people at these cosplay conferences, a lot of them are on Instagram and other, other sort of uh, social media networks where they have huge amounts of followers, millions of followers. So when somebody gets up and goes, I'm only going to put my photographs up on Vero from now on, uh, it means a lot. And a lot of people started to retweet this um, and, and put it up on Instagram and switched over. And we still have a very good following in particular social communities like cosplay. But what happened was popularity brings a larger audience, a larger audience brings user behavior you didn't intend to attract. Um, so what happened was that we got a lot of porn basically coming up into the system. People started to post that. And that's not really what Vero is for. Uh, so we started having to figure out how we're going to control this. So the way that worked was uh, initially we put people on it um, and they started deleting the, the content as quickly as they could. And uh, we had millions of photographs that we had to delete. <laughs> But really of key concern was uh, child pornography. Um, so it's not what you want to be doing as a job, trying to filter this. And it ended up for a while, it was actually me doing that. Um, and it's actually incredibly depressing and very negative. It's just not something you want to do. When you sit here for like uh, eight hours a day, just deleting pornography for a couple of weeks, you don't feel great. Um, and you got to take a lot of regular breaks. So we really worked hard to try and figure out a way that we could use uh, something where it didn't require human intervention to do this. So what we were able to do was take pre-built models uh, and chain them together and use machine learning to go through the photographs and actually see what it could detect. So fortunately, uh, Yahoo actually had released a model that we could use uh, in TensorFlow and it would work in SageMaker, which does uh, nudity detection. It's, a, it's their not safe for work uh, NSFW uh, model. And we were able to chain that with an age detection model that Google had, had already made available. So we're able to look in photographs for number one, nudity, which would flag the photographs as something that needs to be checked. But number two, we were able to combine that and see, is there nudity and are there children? And when that happened, we were able to automatically submit that to a, a unit within the FBI. So what happens is the way, the way uh, child pornography detection works is you submit to the FBI any uh, content that you want to have investigated and they contact the other local bodies, other local, for, local law enforcement bodies around the world. So using machine learning, we were able to hugely reduce the amount of human intervention that was required uh, to process this. And um, it, was, it, it was a lifesaver basically. Now we still have a human team that has to check it, but they're checking far less. Um, and a lot of it is just done by machine learning. One interesting point about this is that when you're using uh, models like the, uh, an image classification model, uh, like the Yahoo one I mentioned, which is the not safe for work one, 
machine learning models don't really necessarily say anything definitive. They give things a score and they, they map out a probability. So you can see if I run these two images through the not safe for work model, it, this is the score. These are the scores that it give it as the chances of this being uh, pornography. And as you can see, the one on the left has a very, very low chance. There's an increased chance for the one on the right. Um, it clearly isn't a pornographic image, but it can identify that there is it, it's it's somewhat related to it, so there is a chance. Um, so you you have to kind of decide to what extent you want to um, have these thresholds set at. You might decide that anything over seventy five, we're going to say, needs a human needs to look at it, um, and you need to look at it that way. The great thing is is that the the systems have gotten faster and faster. So now even when people upload video, you can analyze the video in real time. Um, so this is an example, not one we did because I'm not going to show one of the ones we did uh, on this sort of uh, presentation, but I, you know, hopefully this will work okay over a, over a screen share. But you can see this is a system called uh, You Only Look Once, analyzing a piece of a James Bond movie. And you can see how quickly it's, uh, there might be some lag there, I don't know, but you can you know, hopefully you get the idea of how quickly it's able to uh, classify items in a video in real time. It makes some mistakes. Um, it does classify some things that aren't actually in the picture at times, um, but in general, it's very, very quick and very, very accurate. Um, so another one we were asked to do was to do a call appointment um, system. So we had a cancelled appointment system. So we had a situation where we were working with a, a call center company uh, called HTEC in Waterford, and HTEC um, basically do the call center work for an awful lot of uh, US-based medical uh, com medical companies, hospitals, doctors' uh, offices, and obviously one of the big problems they have is a, is when appointments are cancelled, they need to fill them again as quickly as possible. Um, so they wanted a way that we could build a system that would do this automatically. So we actually built a system that users could call into based on Amazon Connect. So Amazon Connect is Amazon's call center system. I can't really demonstrate this over the over the, the Zoom call, but basically you could call it and talk to a machine. Now, Google have demonstrated systems like this, but they're actually can be built by companies completely in the cloud, completely with hosted uh, hosted elements um, and hosted services and functions as a service. So using three Amazon services, using Amazon Connect, Amazon Lex, and Amazon Poly, we're able to create a situation where the user will call into a system that we built uh, entirely visually. So you can see this is the contact, contact flow designer. And we're able to build in the steps into the conversation vis visually and call out the code when we need to, but we don't always have to. So you can see here, we're invoking a piece of code here. So there is the option to integrate, but most of this conversation is built visually. And users are able to call that number and talk to a system that we uh, prototyped and, and showed to them. Um, I'm just getting conscious of time because I know we're, we're, we're working through the time. So I'll, I'll move on to... The final example that I have, which is uh, related to uh, Roisin Foley, who has motor neuron disease. So this was as part of the Big Life Fix, which was um, has been on RTE over the past few months, um, covering a lot of different situations, a lot of different uh, issues that people have, um, illnesses or disabilities that people have. And the, the idea of the show was to be able to use technology to help these people. So... Roisin, uh, as I said, had motion, motor neuron disease, and there is no cure for motor neuron disease. She will ultimately die of the disease, and she was given approximately two years uh, to, to live from the point of diagnosis. But one of the uh, things that bothered her most was the fact that she was going to lose her voice, and she wouldn't be able to talk to her children. Um, and her voice was already starting to, to weaken by the time uh, we were approached to see what we could do uh, to help in, in the show. So we built an app, uh, and the app um, basically was designed to do a couple of things. One of the things it did was voice banking, so she could record herself in there and record memories um, for her kids. Um, but also, we captured a lot of her voice, and by capturing her voice, we were able to make a, a soundboard, and we combined that with um, IoT. So we were able to put beacons on her children and in her house, so that as she moved around and as her children moved around, we were able to change the presentation of what was available for her to say in the soundboard uh, to suit the situation. So if, he was, if she was in the kitchen and one of her daughters is in the kitchen, the options she had where she would just have to press the, the, um, the button to, to deliver the voice, 
would change. But the other thing we looked at was a system called Lawyerboard, again, a hosted system, uh, which would try and synthesize your voice. Now, we only use this to a certain extent, but we did integrate it into the app uh, where Roisin could type into the app and it would synthesize something approximating her voice. It's not perfect. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's better, obviously it's, it's better when, she can, when we can use elements of her own voice. But I'll try and give you an example um, of what, it, what the difference is between using um, something like AWS Poly and Lawyerboard. And you, you get an impression of where things are going in this regard. So this is a recording of Roisin's original voice. Um, there are buttons here, but they've disappeared in the presentation. So hopefully I hit the right one. I want to sunshine now, Derek, let them play. So that's a recording that we took of Roisin's voice. What we actually did was for a week, we put a microphone strapped on a, a device with a microphone uh, onto Roisin. So as she went around talking, we captured everything she said, and we were able to cut that up into individual uh, pieces of, of voice. So um, it captured everything because it wasn't like it, we didn't give her a script and say, say this into the mic. It was everything that she said for the week. You can hear she's a strong Dublin accent, a very distinctive voice. So if we try and get AWS Polly to say the same thing, the type of output we get is something like this. Look at the sunshine out there. Get out and play. Okay, it's played the wrong one. That's actually the lower board one. So you can hear that synthesized voice has something similar to the accent that... Uh, Roisin has. It's got a Dublin accent. I'll try the poly one again and we'll see if we can... Look at the sunshine out there. Get out and play. So the, the options for her up till now were, were basically things that were either made her sound like Stephen Hawking or made her sound like that uh, with a received pronunciation. So it didn't have any of the character of who she was as a person, but we were able to integrate this into the app and she was able to communicate and it was a huge success. Um, she was really, really happy with the app in, in all different aspects of it, like not only the soundboard and the voice banking, but also the, the synthesis. And actually, it ended up be, becoming a thing where her kids have a great laugh with it uh, in the house, like asking her for permission and then pressing the buttons themselves, uh, giving themselves permission without her intervention. So um, it, it became a, a, a source of fun for the family. And it's something that we're looking at being able to expand on to make it more generally applicable because it's... Um, it, right now, it's, it's built for Roisin. So we have had other people with modern neuron disease and other diseases where people are going to lose their voice come to us and ask us how we can help with that. So we're, we're looking at how we can continue the development. So that's what I have today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. So I'll hand back to Ruth. Sorry. Thanks, Keith, uh, for that. And you're, you're bang on time as well. Um, we do have some time now for some questions or some comments, so we're going to open the, um, you don't say open the floor, open the Zoom to our audience there. So if you'd like to pick up on anything at all or have comments for Keith, please fire away. Well, look, I'll kick off then. Uh, Keith, um, you talk a lot about um, accessibility and off-the-shelf solutions. How... What's the future like for a company like yours then as everything becomes even more accessible? Like where is the, where is the secret sauce going to be for you and how you manage that? Um, well, I think the thing is that, like I was explaining earlier on with the five points that Google had said, we, we're never getting towards the next steps of that because the, what's available in the cloud is always staying ahead of, of what we need um, so that's moving very, very quickly. And luckily for, for everyone trying to use these systems, um, there's a lot of competition between Amazon, Apple, and you know, all, these different, all the different companies who are contributing to this. So they're really trying to move very, very quickly to make services available. Um, and what that means for a company like us is that we're able to focus on delivering value for our customers. So there isn't really value for... Um, curries or permanent TSB or anyone like this in us spending too long doing basic research into voice synthesis or whatever. So other companies are doing that. We can deliver the solutions to the customers. And I think our future is really built around trying to chain services together to make intelligent systems that we can deliver value for our, our, our customers. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, chain systems together to make value. It's uh, and you're particularly strong on the user, use the end user and uh, design and UX as well. So there's mm. a good trend there. 
yeah. Is there anyone the who UX aspect of this is interesting because I mean, there's a there's a concept of uh, of voice design and conversational design, which really didn't like you know when you look at some of those chatbot style uh, solutions, like conversational design wasn't even a phrase a few only three or four years ago. Now that's a that's a job for somebody to do. Yeah, yeah. So to our audience, all you have to do is unmute yourself if you want to come in on the conversation, okay? I've just got a question, Keith. Uh, when you were talking about one of your earlier examples, uh, when you were talking about, uh, I was just trying to remember, um, uh, the passport example, yeah. yeah? Uh, you know, your, your transition from, you know, a, a multi sort of, um, provider uh, solution to you know a full amazon stack mm. can you just sort of um the ch there's a challenge of obviously doing that now what what are the what were some of the the sort of like the the interim challenges in that process mm. well there's both challenges and opportunities with it i suppose i mean okay. the, the challenges for us were that um, to use the software ourselves, to use things like TensorFlow um, directly on our own machines, required allowing quite a bit of time for the people that we have internally to get up to speed, even to how to run those systems, and mm -hmm. allowing them to gain the understanding of how to ingest data, to train a model. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's a relatively complex process using tools that were in development while we were using them, I suppose. Um, so they changed very rapidly and there were lots of things like trying to bring TensorFlow onto, mo onto mobile and so you could run it locally on a mobile device, mm -hmm. uh, running it on the desktop. There were lots of challenges and things changing as we were going. Um, the advantage of moving into the cloud is the fact that um, that's taken care of. I mean, Amazon do that. So that part of it was taken away. So that was very attractive to us. And we had to spend less time training people up. I think the challenges are really, a lot of the challenges are, are conceptual in your, in your mind. When, when somebody comes to you with a, with a, 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 some, a problem to solve, um, like that particular one of, of being able to do document classification, being able to frame that problem as a cloud-hosted machine learning problem is a little bit of a hurdle because our background is is to always think about well we're going to write a load of code that's how we're going to solve this we're going to write code and you feel like you're going to jump straight into writing code um but of course code is risky and code is expensive so uh if there's something there that you can use um it's worth doing but i think it's uh like you know if you can if you can use the systems in the cloud but I think the situation is when we have people out talking to customers, first hearing about the problems, even myself, it took me quite a while to really start thinking about, okay, mm -hmm. I could do this with a, a cloud hosted uh, yeah. function as a service that Amazon already provide or Google. I mean, we're not tied to any one of them. We've used more Amazon, um, but that's mm -hmm. really because they were the first mover. That's, the, you know, they, they, they had the cloud services first. That's really why. I don't know. Does that, does that answer the question? Oh, it certainly does. I'm, I was just concerned about in terms of your teams and, you know, the agile sort of setup. Were you working with a framework to do that? Because some of that is ad hoc. Something works, something doesn't. How mm. do you deal with that side? Because it's very much operational sort of developments and there's some linear aspects of that as mm. well. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a very difficult one to plan and actually uh, try and... Um, to try and project manage. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult one from that perspective because as I was saying, there's definitely an, a, an element of failure in, in this and you don't generally write your project plan assuming that a for, your first few iterations would fail and then you'll eventually get something out of it. And at times we have uh, had to go back to customers and explain that like, you know, we've tried this approach and it's just not working. You know, that's, that's happened. Yeah, so yeah. you have to build that in. Um, and again, I suppose, with the cloud systems, things are a bit more certain in that you're, you, if you're dealing with a function as a service, rather than going back to something like TensorFlow, which is a, you know, a neural network system, yeah. you're, you're doing less of the basic research. Um, but it's a, it is an interesting point because it's a difficult one from a sales perspective. Um, we did have a bank approach us about doing a system and I had to write a proposal to them, which was basically like, you're going to give us a lot of money and we don't guarantee anything is going to work. <laughs> um, and they weren't very happy with that. So, um, 
it's a difficult sell when, when you get to that sort of level. But, uh, but that's a part of it. I mean, at a low level, that, that is a part of, of uh, machine learning. But it's not every part of it. You know, there are plenty of things off the shelf now. Okay, but great solution. Thanks. Thank you. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Keith, I'd like to thank you for your time today and a fantastic presentation. Uh, if you want to check out Marina Software, they're on marinasoftware.com. Uh, next week, we have AI for Marketers with Steph Locke. Steph is going to go through a range of different content and automation tools for marketing professionals. Um, so please share or uh, register if you want to come along. Thank you for your time today. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and that's uh, a wrap. If you want to find out more about a little bit more about what we do at Nightingale um, and about the series, please uh, approach myself or staff. We're always happy for feedback and for uh, further conversations. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe. Bye bye.